Welcome to Neurosurgery Grand Rounds. Um, I'm Ryder Gwynn. I'm a functional neurosurgeon. Uh, Dr. Schoen likes to call us dysfunctional neurosurgeons, but uh, we never listen to him. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about essential tremor, uh, kind of evolving from medications uh, to the current therapies today, kind of focusing on um, the interventional therapies as opposed to the medication therapies. Um, so these are my disclosures. I've uh, worked with a number of device companies over the years, um, sometimes more one year than the next, but uh, I, I have a vested interest in all of this technology. So take that with the, take everything I say with a grain of salt. Um, so, you know, tremor is a very normal thing. Almost everybody, in fact, everybody does have some degree of tremor. Maybe a little bit worse when you're giving a talk or after your fifth cup of coffee, um, after exercise. Uh, that's, you know, physiologic tremors. Tremor is just part of daily life. But um, for some people, the tremor consumes their entire life and it can affect pretty much everything that they do. Writing, using a keyboard, uh, dressing, eating, all of the activities that we do on a daily basis and take for granted can pretty much come to a crashing halt when your tremor becomes bad enough. And um, with essential tremor, um, the worst thing is that it, it really comes out the most as you try to do something. Most people with essential tremor don't have a resting tremor, but as soon as they reach out to grab something or to do something, um, everything goes haywire in their, in their hands and arms. So this is a patient of mine, uh, one of the first patients I operated on actually in 2004, I think, and um, he had a very young onset um, uh, essential tremor and, and did very well. He had deep brain stimulation. You could see on the left was his device off and on the right was his device on. So I'd like to just go through some facts about essential tremor, a uh, little bit of the anatomy, and then talk about the different interventions. Um, essential tremor is a postural or kinetic disorder, so the tremor comes out when your arm assumes a certain position or as you reach or do a specific action type of kinetic tremor is intention tremor, which is classic where it gets worse as you approach your target. Uh, it most commonly affects the hands, then the head, the voice, the tongue. Leg can be involved, but is not quite as common or frequent. Um, there is a typical frequency of the tremor, and that frequency is higher as when we're younger. And as we age, uh, if you have a central tremor, it will get slower uh, over time. It's still a faster tremor than the, than the kind of pill rolling, uh, resting tremor of Parkinson's disease. Um, the onset is a bimodal distribution. Um, it's, it's, it is uh, genetically an autosomal dominant uh, condition, although there can be sporadic um, uh, mutations and patients generally are, that patient was started when he was 18, somewhere between 18 and 30, and then again, uh, over about 45, it becomes much more common again. Um, and there are some environmental factors that have been linked, uh, some chemicals that are used in manufacturing uh, and lead. Uh, and uh, these proteins called harmanes, which can be created by um, basically barbecuing meat. So uh, those harmanes tend to make tremor worse. Sorry, Jordan. So, <laughs> um, so these are the different medications that are used to treat essential tremor. You know, it's kind of like epilepsy, which is another love of mine. There's a ton of different things you can do in terms of giving them different medications and trying out, seeing what will help. Um, but there are only two really useful medications that have um, really high level of established efficacy, and those are primidone and propanolol. And pretty much everybody who has essential tremor should be tried on each of these before going on to a intervention of some kind. Um, if they do fail uh, both of these, though, the likelihood of responding to these other medications, which have much less demonstrated efficacy, uh, it's pretty unlikely to control the tremor at that point in time.
And so the, these are the people that are referred on to uh, intervention. And uh, all of our patients uh, are seen by movement disorder neurologists to make sure that the diagnosis is correct, that they have tried the appropriate medications, um, that there aren't other comorbidities that would make these kinds of interventions less effective. Thank you. Um, so I'll go over first uh, deep brain stimulation. Um, the, the, the target that we use to treat essential tremor is really only one, and it's a part of the thalamus and a small nucleus called the VIM, ventralis intermediate nucleus of the thalamus, and you can see that uh, here in the red is the VIM. Uh, the thalamus has kind of a somatotopic organization that mimics the cortex, and so the anterior nuclei um, are sort of the affective nuclei uh, brought, connected with the limbic system. The motor nuclei are more anterior, and then the sensory nuclei are more posterior. And right in between here is the VIM, kind of at the junction between the, the, the motor and the sensory nuclei of the thalamus. <clears throat> and they get input from the cerebellum, mostly from the joint position receptors. So they're, they're, this relay station is uniquely positioned to help control movement and, and control specifically opposing muscles when you're trying to smoothly uh, create some sort of action. And so if there's an imbalance uh, in that circuitry between the thalamus, the, the cerebellum, uh, the cortex, uh, and the reticular nuclei, the, there can be an oscillatory imbalance in that, mo that smooth motion. Um, and so, um, you know, it's really, like I said, it's uh, thought to get mostly proprioceptive inputs. Um, and then um, there, nobody really, really knows what the origin is. Nobody has found a sort of lesion or a number of cells that are dead in, in a central tremor the way uh, we know about the dopamine-containing cells in Parkinson's. Uh, but we think that, that there are essentially syn synchronous loops that are set up in all of these um, different connections of the circuit. Um, we know that there are pathological oscillations within the network. And in fact, when you record from the VIM nucleus, you can find cells that are bursting in frequency that exactly matches the frequency of the tremor and the cell firing precedes the, the actual motor uh, movement. So we do think that this is a kind of proximal um, uh, nuclei that is contributing, if not uh, you know, really causing the tremor in these patients. Um, this is not easy to see, but this is an axial MRI. You can see this is the thalamus right here, and our target for all of these interventions uh, is right here. Uh, this target was initially treated uh, with what's called a thalamotomy using radiofrequency um, thermal probes to basically ablate that lesion, uh, that area. Uh, this is the uh, VIM nucleus here. You can see this is a blow up of the thalamus. Here's the internal capsule. And there is a somatotopic organization within the VIM nucleus itself with representation of the head more medially and limbs more laterally. And we're trying to lesion just this small, very specific area uh, around the hand and arm part of the VIM nucleus. So uh, all of these interventions have to be extremely precise to be effective and to not affect the surrounding areas. Here is the sort of primary sensory thalamus. If we uh, ablate this area, people will have sensory problems, uh, motor problems if we ablate here uh, or here. So uh, deep brain stimulation for the treatment of central tremor was the first indication approved by the FDA in 1997. Uh, it preceded the, the use for Parkinson's disease, dystonia, and, and uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. And like I said, the thalamotomy really was, the, was a pioneering step towards DBS. That started in the 50s. And uh, D DBS was really experimented first for pain, but never received an FDA approval for pain, and uh, was then used for central tremor in the uh, early uh, 90s. So here's the surgical procedure itself. We essentially admit the patient, bring them in, apply a head frame, uh, get a CAT scan, usually in the operating room, uh, do our targeting on our uh, navigation software, come up with the coordinates that we plug into the frame, 
make a burr hole, pass an electrode down, Patients are awake for most of this procedure, and we can actually turn the device on, get feedback from them, uh, and try to demonstrate a tremor arrest in the operating room to help us know that we're in the right spot. If we don't get uh, what we want, we might move the electrode. Uh, also, if we get side effects during the stimulation in the operating room, we might adjust the location of the electrode as well. So there's a high degree of flexibility about making sure that we're in the right target before we leave the operating room. We generally then get another CAT scan to verify we're in the right place, and then patient goes to the ICU and then home the next day. A second surgery is done to place the pulse generator, usually about a week later. Um, Medtronic was the first uh, company to create a DBS device, and really they were the only ones on the market up until essentially last year. So for decades, two decades now, they've really uh, both been the only player, they've had a monopoly, but they've also done a lot to help uh, progress the field during that time as well. Um, However, in the last year or so, a uh, little over a year, uh, there has been the entrance of two other companies. These companies already make neuromodulation devices, mostly for uh, spinal cord stimulation for pain. Uh, St. Jude, which has now uh, been bought by Abbott, uh, came out with the next generation of devices. They, their, their big difference is that they now have a lead that is segmented, so when we put it into the brain, Instead of being able to only use these contacts, uh, switching from one to the other and essentially moving the, the field up and down the electrode, uh, they're segmented so that we can direct the, the current in, in a kind of radial directional fashion. So if we're looking down the pipe of the electrode, you can turn on individual side contacts. Here you can see we're using the cathode here as a negative and then using the IPG, the pulse generator, as the anode. And you can see we can push the field uh, backwards and to the right. Uh, and we can pretty much move it in any direction we want by combining different uh, segmented pieces of that uh, electrode. And so that really affords us the ability to try to steer the current if it's not a perfectly placed electrode in the nucleus, we can try to push it away from structures that we don't want to stimulate and more toward structures that we do want to stimulate. Um, there's also a device out now uh, by Boston Scientific, which has really just come out. We don't even have it approved here at Swedish yet, but we're trying to get it approved. Um, this device is made by Boston Scientific, and they're, they're basically, uh, their claim to fame is that they have eight contacts on their electrode. They do not currently have a steerable electrode the way Abbott does. They do in Europe, but it's not approved yet here in the United States. But they do have something called uh, multiple independent current uh, control, which allows uh, normally the other companies have uh, contacts that you can either turn on or off. Uh, with Boston, you can actually turn multiple on and then switch the current um, very in a very graded fashion from one to the other. So the, they have independent amplifiers for each of these contacts rather than having one amplifier run eat, uh, all the contacts and just turning them on or off. Uh, not clear whether this is going to be a superior strategy uh, or not, but, but uh, definitely having a longer um, electrode may afford us to interact with more areas within the network uh, to help tremor. So uh, just talking about the effectiveness, most of this literature really is based on the Medtronic devices. Um, from back to 1997, uh, the American Academy of Neurology in, in 2005, and then again in 2011, um, published guidelines uh, looking at a, uh, treatment of essential tremor with DBS and basically state that uh, you can get a significant 60 to 90% reduction in the contralateral limb with unilateral deep brain stimulation. Um, we, I would say that there's another study, well, there's been multiple studies, but this one here in 97 demonstrated that 90% of patients who were implanted had uh, moderate or marked improvement in their tremor. Um, it, it was sustained at two years, uh, but clearly over time, there is some loss of control of the tremor. And I would say most people, I don't think there's any clear understanding of why that is. Some of it may be habituation to stimulation, although, I, I think that's 
less likely. We certainly have people who have done very well, like the patient I just saw over 10 plus years, uh, but, but there definitely can be disease progression along uh, with the central tremor that may account for some of the loss of tremor control with time. Um, Bilateral stimulation can and is often done with DBS. It is actually not FDA approved for bilateral stimulation, but it's done at almost every center that does DBS. With bilateral stimulation, you're much more likely to be able to capture a head or a voice tremor uh, with bilateral stim. Um, there are definitely side effects with stimulation, or there can be. as um, again, relating to the structures that are nearby where the electrode is and, and inadvertently stimulating those structures. Dysarthria, paresthesias are probably the most common, people getting tingling sensations in the opposite hand or face or even leg. Um, with bilateral stimulation, uh, you can get uh, balance problems as well. And I would say speech uh, speech problems are also something we're likely to see, particularly with bilateral stimulation. Either you can get some tongue thickening or some difficulty even finding words sometimes, particularly with a dominant thalamus implantation of the electrode. There are also risks of the procedure itself. So like any brain surgery, anytime you go uh, into the calvarium, you have a risk of hemorrhage, you have a risk of infection, um, and certainly, particularly with bilateral placement of electrodes, if you do the two at the same setting, and that's one of the reasons we don't do that, you can get some transient confusion, particularly in a more elderly uh, patient. Um, so. The surgical risks we really can't uh, mitigate in any way other than trying to be as careful as we can be in the operating room. The side effects related to stimulation we can mitigate by changing the parameters of the stimulation. And that's one of the benefits of DBS over the other interventions that I'll talk about is that if you do have problems with the therapy, you can adjust the stimulation to try to minimize those problems and kind of create the maximal therapeutic window that you can. Uh, with the adjustments that are possible with DBS. Uh, next, I'll talk about Gamma Knife. Um, Gamma Knife really came about almost in the same time frame uh, as DBS, um, and uh, uh, Dr. Lexell, who really originated this, wanted to use it essentially for functional neurosurgery uh, in the beginning, although it's used for uh, many different uh, targets in, in the brain today. Uh, it's basically 201 beams of gamma radiation from radioactive cobalt sources that are uh, shot through usually four millimeter collimators, and then they all cross at one space, and you basically put the patient's head right where all those beams cross, and wherever you place that uh, patient in, in the machine, you'll get a, a lesion with a long enough uh, time in there. We typically deliver about a 130 to 140 gray dose, which is usually about 45 minutes to an hour, uh, depending upon how old the sources are. Uh, and then uh, they come back out, and um, they can get typically tremor control within a couple of months afterwards. It's not something that is an immediate effect. It takes time for the radiation to um, create the lesion in the thalamus. Again, the target is this same area, the VIM nucleus, um, and the, it's very flexible in terms of blocking areas. If you don't want certain beams to go through certain places, you can look at where the dose fall off is. Here you can see the internal capsule where all the motor fibers are traveling. We're going very close but it's very good at being able to kind of shape that uh, lesion to some degree um, with, with using uh, different collimators. Um, this is what the lesion looks like after a, a successful lesion is delivered. Uh, on the T2, you get some spread of edema that goes beyond the lesion. Here you can see the internal capsule again kind of getting a little bit of edema in it, um, but, but the, the enhancing lesion itself is staying within the borders of where we want. Um, the benefits of this is that there, you know, you don't have to make any incision. You just have to put a frame on. Um, you just do a one-time treatment. There's not a lot of follow-up involved. Um, if somebody can't come off of blood thinners, uh, really DBS is not available to them. And so these are perfect patients to be able to treat uh, with Gamma Knife. Um, and again, about 80% of patients will respond within uh, six months or so. Uh, unfortunately, there are risks as well. 
it is an irreversible lesion that's created. So if something bad, if you miss your target by a little bit, um, you won't find out till two or three months later. And at that point, it's uh, too late to do anything about it. Um, there is sort of an unpredictability uh, of individuals' responses to radiation at any given dose. And so some people have just these idiosyncratic reactions, as you can see here, and um, can get pretty significant side effects. Luckily, you know, it's, it's relatively low uh, at a 5 to 7 percent uh, rate, depending upon which studies you read, uh, but can produce weakness, paresthesia, speech problems um, generally. Um, you know, one of the issues is that you're, you don't get any feedback during the targeting and the delivery of the therapy, uh, which kind of limits uh, your ability to use the feedback from the patient to guide your therapy. Um, looking at the efficacy of Gamma Knife, um, this was a study actually done with folks here, uh, Dr. Vermeulen, Dr. Young, who's no longer here, and Dr. Meyer. Uh, they looked at 172 patients treated with Gamma Knife. Uh, they have done bilateral and unilateral treatments with it. They found about a 7% complication rate, and a little over half of those patients uh, had permanent complications. The, other, the others got better. Um, this was not a blinded study, but it did show about a 50, uh, eight, 51 to 50 58% improvement in different um, writing and drawing measures. Um, and there are a number of other studies that have been published about, particularly about unilateral treatment with gamma knife that are fairly similar to this. Um, they're really, one of the problems with this, with the literature in this area, though, is that there's not a lot of uh, really good controlled studies for it. And so uh, there's the only one that I could find is this one with 14 patients where this, the, the assessments were made in a blinded fashion. And when that was done, um, there was actually uh, an improvement in the activities of daily living, but no statistical improvement could be found in things like drawing, handwriting, action tremor, postural tremor, uh, using uh, a fairly standard scale, the Fon Toulouse and Marin or uh, uh, TRS scale that is used pretty widely uh, in the field. So uh, there are uh, places doing bilateral treatments. Uh, I would say that that is relatively unusual. We are one of the centers here, though, that does it fairly commonly. This is a pap paper published by the Pittsburgh group. They looked at uh, 11 patients that were treated with bilateral stimulation over a 17-year period. Typically, they will treat one side, see how the patient does, and then a year later, if they have responded to the first side, they might come back and treat the second side. And you can see that the tremor scores here, uh, four is worse, zero is better. Patients pre-op uh, were a upper category and then uh, in general got significantly better uh, and also did so on the second treatment as, as well. Um, there were not any cognitive assessments in, in any of these studies to see if there were any um, cognitive deterioration. There, there is some concern for that when we do bilateral lesioning of the thalamus, the thalamotomies that were done in the 50s. Initially, a number of people had bilateral treatments and had some cognitive issues afterwards. So we are in, in need of some good studies that look at um, cognitive outcomes in really all of these treatments, uh, but particularly the ablative ones where we really can't take it back. Um, so American Academy of Neurology uh, looked at uh, both deep brain stimulation and gamma knife thalamotomy. Um, a sign, even though they did a recommendation in 2005 and 2011, they still say it's a level C, saying it's possibly effective, uh, but then say that the magnitude of benefit is clearly superior to all available medications. Uh, for Gamma Knife, basically, they're saying there's inadequate evidence to make a really good um, assessment of its efficacy. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about focused ultrasound. Um, because we're one of the few centers nationally that has the technology to be able to employ this therapy here. A um, little bit of background about it. Uh, so this uses essentially the piezoelectric effect. Uh, there are almost you know, many, many devices in uh, use today that take advantage of this effect. But essentially, Jacques and Pierre Curie in 1880 found that if you deformed a crystal, applied pressure to it, you could actually generate an electrical and alternating current by alternating the compression of the crystal. 
Um, and then, then they actually prove the opposite as well, that if you apply electricity to a crystal, you can actually expand and contract the volume of that crystal. And so you can actually create sound waves by al sending an alternate current uh, through a wire into crystal and cre create essentially a little speaker um, with uh, AC current. Um, and that is really the fundamental um, way in which uh, ultrasound is used today, both diagnostically and therapeutically as well. Uh, in the 1950s was where really a lot of this work began. Um, Doc, the, the Fry brothers uh, in Champaign, Illinois, really pioneered the use of using multiple transducers, ultrasound transducers, to try to focus the energy. Um, but back then, they really had a problem with it because you couldn't penetrate the skull uh, with the ultrasound very easily at all. So they had to do craniotomies to be able to uh, get the ultrasound energy to a deep target. Um, Lexell, Lars Lexell, who came up with the gamma knife, actually tried to do focused ultrasound first for his functional procedures, but because of the roadblock of this inability to penetrate the skull, then turn to radiation um, instead. Uh, what really made this possible today to use as a treatment modality is the fact that uh, we've been able to, since the 1990s, uh, combine multiple transducer elements and then focus them um, through an array uh, so that they all meet at one point. And you can actually steer where the focal point is with each of these transducers by, grad by changing the current and the frequency that's been, that's admitted by each one of these transducers. And so you can actually correct for any uh, absorption of the energy by the skull for each of the paths that, are, that it's traveling so that you can create one uh, combined focal point at the target, um, even going through something like bone. The other thing that's really made this possible is the advent of MRI thermometry. So we now have the ability to, in one plane, track the temperature across that slice in almost real time. About every th three seconds, we can get an update and find out exactly what the temperature is in all areas of this slice. And you can see here, um, over time, we've increased the temperature uh, after about 10 seconds. We're reaching a maximal temperature at this location that cools down again. And um, we can do this in an iterative fashion uh, until you get the temperature high enough to lesion this area. And you're getting real-time feedback that you're being accurate in your location and delivery uh, of that lesion. <clears throat> As you raise the temperature, here we have what's called a time temperature curve, uh, and there's fairly good understanding about the relationship between the temperature and the time and the eventual damage that you can create. Um, after about 40 degrees Celsius of temperature increase, you can start to inactivate the functional ability of the neurons in the brain, uh, but, but they're not actually killed at that point. So you can look for tremor reduction, you can look for side effect um, at these temperatures here. Here, and if you're not if you're not getting what you want, then just change the location. Um, and eventually, you know, you get to a point where if you if you hold the temperature for long enough, you'll create a lesion. And then eventually, if, once you get above about 56 degrees centigrade, you'll essentially create an, an immediate thermocoagulative lesion. And so we're using this time temperature curve to create the therapy. Um, so this was all put together by a company uh, called Insitech, and they uh, created this, what they call the Exablate 4000, uh, which is essentially a bed, a, a transducer, a water bath to basically uh, help eliminate the air between the transducers and the scalp, and also to cool the scalp so that there's no overheating during the therapy. Uh, there are lots of embedded safety features, so uh, if you apply too much energy with ultrasound, you can create um, shear forces within the vibrating molecules and create what's called cavitation. Um, and uh, so obviously, it basically just shuts down the therapy if it finds any of that going on, and you get real 
real time, almost real time uh, feedback. And so again, we do, we typically do this in an iter iterative fashion, where we gradually increase the temperature and the energy until we're seeing improvements in the tremor. Here, here you can see a Archimedes spiral, where you see their tremor is still pretty bad right here, but eat over time and with different sonications, you see that the tremor improves. Once you get the result that you want, uh, you're finished with the therapy and you can get them out. It typically takes up to three to four hours to um, go through this process and create the lesion. Um, there was a pilot study that was published in the New England Journal in, I think, 2013 uh, by Jeff Elias at UVA, uh, really pioneered this therapy. Um, and he basically looked at 15 patients and found about a 62% improvement in tremor at three months um, and had basically a, a number of paresthesias, which were really the only significant side effect that he found at that time. Most of those got better over time. One patient had ongoing dysesthesia, meaning unpleasant sensation in their fingertips that persisted a year out after uh, the therapy. But you can see here there is quite a good uh, response to uh, hand tremor in the contralateral hand to the treated side. There's a little bit of recurrence of the tremor in this study over the one-year period. Um, most of it was, you know, really a couple of patients had some loss of tremor control, but it really was a proof of concept and led the way to uh, um, a larger study, which we took part in. Um, they also, in their study, helped really define what the lesions looked like. Um, there's sort of a, a coagulative core of the lesion. There's then a penumbra where, where you know you can't really predict whether this tissue will survive or not. And then there's an area of edema around it, um, which is really just swelling and will inevitably uh, get better over time. So the lesional size, you can see, is maximal about one week after the therapy. But uh, after uh, three months and certainly after a year, you can barely see the lesion uh, in the brain. Most of the tissue uh, really kind of falls in around the, the, the necrotic core of the lesion. So we uh, took part along with uh, seven other studies in the ET pivotal trial. Um, this was a sham controlled blinded study uh, of doing a VIM thalamotomy with uh, focused ultrasound. There were 76 patients with the primary efficacy endpoint uh, was um, uh, something called the clinical rating score for uh, scale for tremor. It has eight elements. We looked at resting tremor, postural tremor, action, writing, spirals, straight lines, and some functional pouring component. We looked at secondary endpoints, including functional measures and quality of life measures. Uh, also looked for any kind of adverse events and did follow up at three months, six months, 12 months, uh, and uh, now two years as well, actually. Um, the great part of this is that it was really sham controlled. So you had <clears throat> 76 patients that were actually treated. 56 were initially given the thalamotomy. 20 uh, were given a sham procedure, uh, which is act was pretty tough on these patients to go through this and uh, had to have your head shaved, you know, four hours in the MRI suite, um, not knowing for three months whether or not you got the therapy. Uh, eventually, they were given the choice of being able to go back and have it done again for real, uh, which 19 out of the 20 uh, decided to do. And so, uh, but, but essentially, once you got to the treatment, uh, you, uh, you were included in the end analysis. Um, the primary outcome here, clinical rating scale for tremor, you can see there was a statistical improvement in the overall score. This score is not a percent reduction in tremor. It's a percent reduction in the overall score. Um, and I'll show you more about just the tremor component. But you can see that the tremor uh, improved in most uh, of the patients uh, that were treated, and the sham patients were really kind of uh, all over the map. Um, here, the, the disability and functional subscores of the CRST, the Part C, you can see there was a, a statistical improvement at three months and 12 months. There was improvements in the disability scores in each of the subscores um, over uh, that three-month and 12-month time frame. And the um, 
basically questionnaire for patients and looking at quality of life and improvement uh, was also significant at both three and 12 months afterwards. Those are subjective assessments rather than objective assessments by physicians. Uh, looking at the adverse events, uh, paresthesias very similar to gamma knife uh, and DBS. Paresthesias were the most common, uh, mostly in the hand, although uh, face uh, was included in some patients. 14% of patients reported this at 12 months out afterwards. So that was not an insignificant, um, essentially long-term uh, effect of this. K2 patients had taste disturbance, which I don't understand. Um, there were a number of, of balance issues. There, there were basically objective measurements of balance problems in two patients, and then subjective uh, sort of just saying that our ba my balance is off in another three patients, uh, and a, uh, one patient had very mild uh, weakness. Um, looking at just the crossover patients, it was kind of interesting. We had a, basically a better result in the patients who first got the sham treatment, this is the yellow line, and then came back to have the permanent treatment. Those patients 12 months out afterwards had an 83% reduction in the postural component of their tremor. Um, not really sure why, but we think there was probably a learning effect. Each of these centers, other than UVA, had really never done this before uh, entering into the trial. And so those patients were treated later, and we think just a little bit of improvement in our targeting and ability to get patients through this therapy may have uh, resulted in an improvement, but really not no way to say for sure. Um, so one of, one of the things to take in mind with this study is that three patients actually that were in the treatment arm failed to be able to complete it, and yet their outcome had to be included in the primary outcome assessment. Um, and one of those patients was one of ours because their skull turned out to be too thick to be able to penetrate uh, with the focused ultrasound energy enough to cr actually create a lesion. We now actually do something called a skull density ratio in all of our patients to make sure that they have a morphology to their skull that will allow us to treat them. Um, and, you know, you have to realize this is a pretty tough treatment for patients to go through. In some ways, it's even tougher than DBS because they have to really lie flat for so long. Each of these sonications can actually be uh, a little bit unpleasant, particularly as we get to the highest levels. People can feel the heating of their scalp. Um, they often get dizzy. Uh, the, nobody knows exactly why, but they often feel like they're falling over backwards while we're applying this uh, energy to them, and they do have to undergo a full head shave. So, um, so I had to give a talk at the uh, CNS last year in October, and the, the title was, you know, is Focus Ultrasound Ready for Prime Time? Um, and um, I, I sort of tried to compare it to DBS, um, but there have been a, a number of studies over the time, but not, not many that were, not any that were fully controlled the way the focus ultrasound trial was controlled. So I basically compared it to uh, the last uh, big study that was done in DBS, and that was the one done by St. Jude when they were rolling out their uh, DBS device. Um, and basically they had uh, also the same number of patients, 76 patients, who underwent DBS therapy and then had blinded assessments. So they themselves were not blinded, but the raters of their tremor were blinded. And you can see, uh, or uh, in a subset of patients, the, the, the raters were blinded. And you can see that there was basically a 58% improvement um, with the device uh, on in those patients uh, with the blinded assessment. Now six months afterwards, they also found a uh, significant improvement in quality of life. So 37% improvement at 12 months, uh, similar to the pivotal study. And so if you just combine, uh, really compare the two, similar uh, size, uh, the, the control was not quite as good in the DBS uh, trial. The actual tremor reduction, which is the part A of the CRST, where they're looking at postural, resting, and intention tremor, was good, but not quite as good as focused ultrasound. Uh, and the, the adverse events were a little dissimilar with focused ultrasound, uh, really paresthesias and gait problems were the biggest issues. Uh, in this study, there was basically 
one uh, patient that had a pretty significant, significant intracranial hemorrhage with persistent permanent weakness afterwards, uh, and uh, I think one patient with an infection as well. So in conclusion, the, for the ET uh, with focused ultrasound, it's been approved by the FDA now, but it is not a, approved by Medicare for funding. So uh, if patients want to have this therapy, it has to be paid for essentially out of pocket. Um, we definitely need longer term follow-up. Uh, there is a treatment curve, a learning curve for this treatment uh, with each center. Um, and this is just the first uh, indication uh, that is being used with a focused ultrasound right now, essential tremorous. It was really kind of an ideal condition to be able to study uh, with focused ultrasound. Um, this is a graph from a paper that's actually not published yet. It's just uh, accepted, basically showing that the, the tremor uh, control at two years out is fairly similar to the tremor control at one year out. Um, so it does appear to be a relatively uh, durable lesion, at least to two years uh, with the focus ultrasound. Um, you can see here that this is published by the Focus Ultrasound Foundation, just a list of all the different um, sort of indications that are being looked at for treatment with the central with focus ultrasound. Central tremor is the only one that's FDA approved, uh, but people are looking at depression, Alzheimer's, epilepsy, pain, trigeminal neuralgia, uh, really a lot of different indications. So it's a very exciting research uh, area. So last, just to talk a little bit about future directions for uh, treatment of essential tremor. Um, really, you know, right now most people are using what's called indirect or anatomical targeting to find out where this uh, VIM nucleus is in the brain. We basically go a standard set of millimeters away from a midpoint of the brain that we define with internal landmarks. Um, but not everybody has the exact same anatomy, and so sometimes we're a little bit off uh, because an individual patient has a different location of their VIM. They're, they might have a larger ventricle, they might have some you know, atrophy, other things. So we're really trying, a, lot, a number of centers are trying to image the pathways themselves using diffusion tensor imaging to image this dentato rubrothalamic tract, uh, which really lies between the pyramidal tract and the medial lemniscal tracts, uh, to really try to uh, and be more precise for an individual's uh, uh, pathways. And so here you can see in one paper they've tried to uh, get the dentato rubrothalamo tract uh, and then place the electrodes right there. Um, there is only one paper so far that looks at any kind of clinical efficacy and they just point to a number, a couple of patients where they can see that the pathway that they've defined um, in a patient that uh, that had the electrode very close to that pathway had a very good response, uh, whereas, um, again, with diffusion tensor imaging, when they uh, see that the pathway is a little bit off from where the electrode placement is, a uh, patient had a smaller, uh, a, a less beneficial outcome with DBS. Um, so really, I think doing individual uh, targeting based on the tractography uh, is, a, is a great place that we're going to be moving to in the next couple of years. Um, there are also um, ideas about how to basically stimulate in a more intelligent fashion. Right now, we're using what's called open loop stimu stimulation, where time essentially defines when we're going to apply each stimulus. So it's just always going on. Um, but it would be nice to have some feedback from the patient to say when we should be turning up the stimulation and when should we should be turning down the stimulation. So a number of centers are looking at this, either using external accelerometers to measure the tremor and then give the device the feedback to adjust the amplitude, or now even internal uh, measurements. We want biomarkers to be able to say you know, when the tremor is getting worse and when it's not. Um, the group at UCSF uh, with Phil Stars really pioneered this by placing electrodes over the cortical surface in patients with actually Parkinson's. There is something called a beta band um, that tends to get uh, more prominent when somebody's Parkinsonian um, uh, symptoms are in 
worse control, and you can use that beta band to adjust the stimulation uh, for Parkinson's, and the same thing can be done with the central tremor uh, group at UW, actually, with Andrew Coe, and their, uh, their Center for Sensor Neural Engineering are working on this to basically uh, place a strip electrode over the sensory and motor cortex, uh, use a similar beta band, not exactly, to uh, use it as a biological marker to then um, determine whether or not to turn up or down the stimulation. Um, it is certainly there's no evidence at this point that this is a superior form of stimulation in terms of improving outcome, uh, but there is a good indication that it will actually save battery life by really ramping down the stimulation when it's not necessary. Uh, I think they have two patients that are implanted now um, and fairly limited data yet on the outcome of that. So with that, uh, I'm all finished and love to take any questions.